Perfect. Okay, so my name is Mike Biltonen, and I am, I've been an apple grower for a very, very long time. The last five years, I've been an orchard consultant, so I work with growers throughout the Northeast. Um, when Field pitched this topic to me, I kind of like kicked rocks and shook my head because I'm not sure that I could really give an even-hand presentation about the you know conventional versus IPM versus you know organic orcharding. Um, but it didn't take me very long to realize that I actually could, um, although I'll, I will end on a note that probably um, reveals my overall opinion uh, of which direction we should be going. Um, so I won't leave it um, uh, ambiguous in terms of where my windmill tilts, um, or which windmill I'm tilting at, I guess. Um, so uh, I've been growing apples since 1984, and I started working in an orchard in central Virginia that was, at the time when I started working, I didn't have a concept about uh, how apples were grown, what constituted an orchard, except that there were trees and there were these things that apples that grew on these trees. Um, uh, it turned out to be, still to this day, the largest orchard I've ever been involved with. It was not 900 acres of apples, 600 acres of peaches. Um, they grew a variety of other things, um, and it was a very large packing house distributed all over the United States uh, and, and exported to Europe. And actually, we were one of the few companies in the 90s that started exporting fruit to Cuba when that whole thing opened up, or maybe it was the 2000s, I don't remember. Um, but what I do remember about this orchard is that it was... Uh, at, 1984 was, a, was, was still sort of the dark ages because we hadn't gone through the, the Alar scare, we meaning the apple industry. Um, we still didn't have federal worker protection standards in terms of what orchard owners and operators needed to do for their staff to keep them safe from the effects of pesticides. We were still using a whole bevy of stuff that if we were using it today, you know, we'd want to go lock ourselves in a bomb shelter because the stuff was so toxic. A lot of that's in the history books at this point, um, but it is part of my history because it was, you know, kind of where I cut my teeth, no, no, no pun intended. Um, in, in, in 1989, I left this orchard. I went to Cornell. I got my master's degree in pomology. I was there. I got it. My master's started a PhD. Decided I really wanted to be in the field and not in you know crunching data um, for the next four years or even the next 40 years. And so I left to go work at an orchard in Minnesota, um, which was the home of to some degree, the Honeycrisp Apple. Um, it was a very interesting experience, which allowed me uh, in my, my overall progression um, as a horticulturist to understand that there was something more than what I had learned the previous five years at that other orchard in terms of how you approach um, orchard management, pest control, and that I knew about integrated pest management. This was really the first time that I started to get to, to practice it. Um, and, you know, in 1992, I guess it was, the USDA Organic Practices um, and the label came out, shifted all of that stuff from really, you know, funky back to the landers who were selling organic produce to something that you could actually put a label on, you could get certified, and you could sell it into Shaw's or Hannaford's or Big Y or whatever supermarket you were shopping at, as well as your local funky little co-op. Um, and so that, uh, I was able to dive in and really begin to test the boundaries of what uh, orchard management, pest management, IPM meant, both philosophically and in practice, in part because in Minnesota, we're not, uh, obviously, we weren't on the East Coast. We had a lot fewer pressures, pest pressures in terms of insects, diseases. The growing climate was different. Um, it was obviously, it was much, much colder um, in the winter. And so things didn't survive um, as well as they do in a more moderate Northeast climate, even though it does get, you know, a bit chilly and there's some snow here in the Northeast. Um, all over this time, I started to really get a, um, uh, wanted to get a better understanding of what organics meant for orcharding. Because even all through the 90s and into the early 2000s, yes, there were some organic orchards, but largely it had to do with annual crops. And if everything went upside down and your crop failed and you didn't get any carrots that year, you plowed it under and you started next year. You didn't have that luxury with, with, with trees. You planted a tree, you hoped that tree was gonna be there for 30 years, or you planted a thousand trees and you hoped those trees were gonna be there for 30 years. 
you couldn't um, lose the crop um, or allow the health of the orchard to suffer uh, in a way that would basically threaten your livelihood because maybe as as you know dedicated as you may have been or somebody may have been towards organic orcharding the simple fact is is if if you if you do it for two years and everything gets wiped off because the trees die or you don't make any money doing it you're not going to be doing it for very long so I kind of tiptoed into that field and from Minnesota in the late in 1999 I moved to the Hudson Valley uh, and I've been in New York um, every year since except for one year when I was in Northern California and I worked at a, a large organic uh, stone fruit orchard that grew peaches and apricots and kind of gave me a west coast arid climate version of what organic orcharding could look like. They have their own issues. They're not our issues. Um, but it's not just a turnkey operation no matter where you live because you're going you're gonna to run into certain problems. So as I thought about this title, and I, I put the original title up there because it's what Field pitched to me and it's, it's what I wanted to run with. But one of the things I wanted to point out at the beginning is that integrated pest management is not a style of growing per se. It is something that transcends all styles of growing. So from the most hardcore conventional uh, uh, orchard, like the one that I started at in Virginia, to the funkiest biodynamic orchard, um, you know, like the one that I work with in the Northern Hudson Valley, Threshold Farms, um, IPM has a place in all of those practices. So it is not something that, you know, there are IPM practices, but they apply to no matter how you want to, to grow your fruit and or grow your carrots for that matter. But we'll talk about orchards today and not carrots too much. Um, so I'm going to talk about this in a way that looks at conventional, that looks at um, a more conventional light or a softer program, if you will, um, where you're using maybe some more progressive IPM techniques. You've decided you're not going to spray some of the harsher chemicals that are out there, you know, but you're still conventional. You're really not interested in USDA organic or organic of any sort. And then we'll just sort of segue into a more uh, ecological orcharding uh, style, which encompasses organics, biodynamics, holistic, however you want to define it, but something where you're not reliant on synthetic pesticides and you're more reliant on uh, nature to help do the job, um, natural biology, fertility, natural plant resistances. You're basically going to, you're in a, in a scenario where you're leveraging nature to give you what, what you need or give the orchard what it needs to survive and be resilient in a, in a, in a harsh climate when it comes to uh, you know, pests and trying to survive the cold winter temperatures, produce fruit, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and, and help you with a profitable enterprise. And we'll, we'll kind of work through all of that. Um, if there's any questions along the way, you know, any specifics or even general stuff, we can do that. Um, there's not enough time to dive into each of these things into excruciating detail, um, but I do want to try and cover them as comprehensively po as possible to give a, uh, um, a good comparison of the different styles. And there's, a, there's more CT cases, you know, there's CT here back there. Okay. All right, so conventional. All right, so the reality is, is that pesticides have been used for a really, really long time. This isn't something that, you know, Dow or Bayer or Monsanto thought up in the 1930s and 40s. We've been using them for a very long time, you know. If you have, you know, short of when, you know, we were swinging from trees and or hunter-gatherers, when we decided to cultivate the land, grow crops for food uh, on a year-in, year-out basis, there were certain pest pressures, right? And so we know from historical records that uh, sulfur, for example, um, was used as far back as 4,500 years ago in Mesopotamia. All right, so this isn't a 20th century invention. It's not something that somebody concocted to you know, foist upon society. Grow food, you've got pests. If you want food, you have to somehow deal with those particular pests. Um, another one, 4,000 years ago, Rig Veda made, made mention, so this is a, a Hindu text, makes mention of using poisonous plants to control pests in India, which is very interesting because when you, when you think about kind of how we're using 
have used uh, certain plants, particularly like tobacco to extract nicotine to, as an organic insecticide, which was widely used throughout the 20th century in organic or in organic farming in general, um, wrote known um, other products like that. There, are, many of them are very much plant derived. Um, and again, this is something that nature gave the plants that we learned how to leverage to use for ourselves. That stuff is there in large part to give the plant its own sense of its own resistances to pest pressures, um, not because it just wants to be toxic for the sake of being toxic. And so again, we, you know, we'll circle back around. There's a lot out in nature that we can we ha we've only begun to tap into that will allow us to um, farm organically. Um, but at the same time, we're going to have, there's going to have, be a certain level of intervention that happens. 15th century, arsenic, lead, mercury, you know, I guess some wacky scientist in a, in a tower somewhere uh, decided that using heavy metals was going to work. This lasted well into the 20th century. Um, and in fact, I know that, you know, any commercial orchard throughout the United States um, probably has residues of lead and arsenic uh, and mercury uh, in the soil. These things don't dissipate very quickly, at least not, you know, within our lifetimes. They're akin to nuclear waste. We no longer can use these, um, but they are still in the environment. And so this was kind of the, you know, from the 15th century to the 20th century, these three materials were used to control pests. 17th century, we're getting into nicotine sulfate and the first fung fungicides that are, that are occurring. Um, they're getting a little bit more creative, probably as the pop more global population grows and cultivated agriculture expands. Um, there's more pests uh, that they have to deal with, um, more people they have to feed. You're worried about storage of, of products and, as well as just being able to cultivate them. Um, 19th century, pyrethrium, uh, rotenone, all come uh, in, into the forefront. Um, Bordeaux mixture, which is just a, uh, it's a mixture of copper and, and sulfur, copper sulfate and lime, uh, is used as a primary fungicide. I mean, and copper today is still used as a fungicide in organic and conventional agriculture. Um, there are some concerns about it. There's some noise being, well, there was being noise before the current administration took hold that the EPA would look more closely at the use of copper in agriculture because it does build up in the soil and it can cause health problems to local populations, uh, particularly if it gets into uh, groundwater. Um, France has been making noise about banning copper altogether, which has the winemakers in a total, yes, tizzy. Isn't it also really dangerous for the sprayer? For the sprayer? Yeah. You mean like the, the, the person sprayer? Yeah. Well, you, it, it is, but you know, that's, so we were talking about, you know, worker protection standards. If you go in with protective gear, you have, you know, a Tyvek suit, a respirator and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's relatively innocuous to the, the farmer. And if, you know, if you're spraying inside of a spray cab, you know, take proper precautions. It's not. I think where the real problem comes is just in the buildup of the soil. Um, but if you don't take the proper precautions, you know, almost anything can be toxic. And the thing about copper is it's, um, it has a long residual and it builds up in the environment and it can build up in you. So it's not something that you metabolize really quickly um, in the same way that there are synthetics you probably metabolize fairly quickly. Um, so. 20th century, well, you know the story here. You know, we get into, we get to, well, actually from World War I to World War II, the chemical manufacturing industry, scientists are coming up with all kinds of wonderful new concoctions, go through World War II, and the war ends, and now we're left with these capabilities. So what do we do? Instead of using them a war on people, we use them a war on nature, basically. And there's DDT, lead arsenate still being used. Captan, which is a conventional fungicide, um, comes into to play. There's organochlorines, organophosphates, you know, just a whole bevy of things. And in a very short period of time, uh, we begin to really understand what the, the impacts or see what the impacts of these are. Um, the real problem is that we became, and not that these things were bad, because in, in, in discrete instances, they could be very helpful um, to both agriculture and, and from a medical perspective in terms of pest controls. So we became too reliant upon them um, and failed to fully recognize the power that, they, that we had um, 
both in nature and the effect we were having on nature. And so by the 1950s, scientists and farmers recognized that the pests were developing resistances to these, these pesticides um, and that an integrated approach to crop protection was needed. So when I was at Cornell, I took a couple of courses. Um, one was a plant pathologist by the name of Phil Arneson, who, you know, unless you were in plant pathology, the name probably means nothing. But he was, he was a person that I was able to have some really deep conversations with about what integrated pest management meant. Because even in the 90s, integrated pest management was in its infancy. So in 1984, I worked at this large peach orchard. Um, integrated pest management was just starting to be recognized. There's a pest in peaches called oriental fruit moth. It also attacks apples and pears and other fruit crops. Um, but they were developing a IPM technology called mating disruption. And mating disruption basically works by allowing uh, the female sex pheromone to be dispersed into the orchard environment, okay? This is the thing under natural circumstances which attracts males, they mate, the females lay eggs, they hatch, there's larvae, you know, and it just sort of snowballs from there. Well, if they've, they've discovered that if you permeate the air in the orchard with this, this sex pheromone, that the males become so confused, they have no idea where to go, and essentially mating goes to zero, and you don't you you stop that whole life cycle um, in its tracks on that end. <laughs> now it's it's not it's it, it, it's not perfect. And at that point in the game in 1984, it was still in its infancy. But that was like my first practical introduction to IPM was to go out and put these twist ties. Um, they look like little tiny twist ties you would use for garbage bags. The, the pheromone is actually uh, injected inside the hollow tube. You twist it on and it just sort of slowly disperses into the environment. They've refined it a lot since then, um, but it's still not used as widely as it could be in agriculture. Um, and so then in 1992, I had this class uh, with this, this professor, Phil Arneson, and learned a lot about, um, you know, IPM, where it came from, um, how, it, how it worked, um, and the historical background of it. And a lot of the historical background came out of it, not because of a desire to be earth friendly, but because we fucked things up so bad that the pesticides we're using right now no longer work anymore. And so all the pests that we were controlling are now resistant, and now what do we do? Because in one case it was cattle, in another case it was rice, you know, everything. So what they did was they, this was back in the 50s and the 60s largely, um, Indonesia was where the rice problem was, Kurosawa was where the, the, the cattle problem was. And so long short story short was is they just stopped using the pesticides the insecticides they were doing. I mean, they really had no choice. There wasn't an alternative. But what happened was they stopped using it. And if you know anything about how pest populations work is, is that pesticides or insecticides are going to kill the individuals that are most susceptible to it. But within any population, there's a certain percentage of individuals that are not as susceptible and some that even are resistant. So if you continue to use this insecticide over time, what you're doing is you're killing off the most susceptible individuals first, and eventually you're going to leave the most resistant individuals in that population, and that's all that's left. But those individuals are not particularly fit. They don't survive well um, in the environment, um, which is why they were originally a very small portion of the population to begin with. So you stop spraying the insecticide, and what happens? You start to gain back some of the susceptible individuals. You rebuild that population, and then you have, you know, in terms of new chemistries, then you have something to work with again. Now, this could happen over a matter of years. In some cases, it's taken 50 years for this to occur, or 30 years. It's not an overnight thing, because those susceptible populations have to rebuild so that the, the original population um, uh, resembles what it did prior to resistance setting in. But at the same time they were doing this, they were also beginning to understand that there were beneficial insects out there, insects that are predators or parasites of the pest insect that they were trying to control in the first place. And that if they now approached it in a way that they weren't trying to like create a clean slate and wipe out the pest insect, 
but they managed it for a diverse population of beneficials in addition to the pest, then they could also use intervene as needed with sprays to knock down that pest population without kind of shoving everything back down to the, the, the resistant part of that overall population. So this was really kind of the beginning of integrated pest management in that they, we realized that, okay, so our chemistries aren't perfect, we're dealing with nature, nature's dynamic, we need to be flexible, we need to be dynamic, and without sort of throwing insecticides out the window or fungicides, because the same thing happens with, with fungi and bacteria, um, and even quicker because the generational life cycles are a lot quicker. Without throwing all of this stuff out the window, we learned how to manage a little bit better the use of those chemicals uh, uh, to our benefit without coming up with resistant populations. Does that all make sense? Yep. All right, so that's where, that's where integrated pest management started. It started from a really dire situation, not out of some noble desire to be more earth friendly. But we still use DDT, we still use lead arsenate, we still used organophosphates and organochlorines and a lot of wonderful other things. And it was beginning to affect the broader environment. So even though integrated pest management on a certain level was being used around in some parts of the world, in the United States specifically, it really hadn't come into its own. Okay, and we're still, you know, late 50s into the 60s. Rachel Carson writes Silent Spring. You know, the Bald Eagle, Endangered Species Act, we start to get some, some oversight by the federal government in terms of pesticide use and without going into the history of all the pesticide legislation, you know, from the mid 60s, early 70s into the 90s and 2000s, we've really begun to, begun to ratchet back on um, the amount of truly dangerous chemicals that are being used in conventional agriculture to the point where we have still a pretty good library of things that are available and that work and that are not detrimental to the environment or toxic to humans in the way that the stuff that was being used in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and into the mid 80s, 80s was. A lot of this came out, uh, began, to, began to develop, I mean, you know, obviously the bald eagle and DDT is, is a classic story, but we really didn't begin to see legislative change in terms of uh, how pesticides were regulated and used in this country until the Alar incident in 1989, which, uh, again, I don't want to take up time reciting that whole thing, but Alar was a chemical that could be sprayed on apples. It was very valuable to the Macintosh industry, which of course is, was and still is a very important apple in the Northeast, the New England apple industry. Um, but it stopped the ripening of that apple in its tracks to the point where it would hang forever, it would get color, it would store well. It was like short of having a magic wand and pixie dust, it was like the best thing. Well, NRDC got a hold of all this, 60 minutes, the whole, you know, the you know what hit the fan. Um, Alar got pulled, um, consumers got involved, Meryl Streep got involved, a group called Mothers and Others got involved and really use Alar as a jumping off point for let's focus on all of these other things that are going on, okay? So that's kind of the, the, the conventional spiel. Um, so we have all of this and, and these chemicals, these conventional chemicals are still really important. There are, in the way that our food system is right now, um, this is where the even-handed part comes in. The way that our food system is set up right now is, is that, you know, if we didn't have some of these chemistries available to us, you know, we would not have the same food supply that we have today. Some of it would be lost production, some of it would be lost quality or storability, some of it would just be lost cosmetic, um, cosmetics, aesthetics of the, the fruit, particularly with apples. Um, but they are still really important. And in the age of climate change, which we're, we are in the middle of, of course, or in, at the very front end of, we're starting to see a real bevy of invasive insects and new diseases come into the scene, which even under conventional terms, we don't have a clue how to control. And as climate change worsens, as weather patterns become more variable, you know, we're going to see more and more of this. And so not having these particular chemistries, you know, in the library of, in terms of things that we can use, um, our food supply really is at risk to a certain degree. Um, 
and we need to we need to begin to better to, to learn how to manage them better um, keep them more viable because regardless more chem more new chemicals are not going to be coming out of the market very quickly in large part because of the EPA registration process and the cost to companies to do all the work to even give it to the EPA to consider for registration but I don't think we're going to be able to keep up with a number of new pests and if a pest isn't listed on a label of anything you're not supposed to be using it for that pest and and so we need to have a better approach to how we manage not just our food system, but the use of these important chemistries um, because our food supply will begin to suffer, uh, I, I believe, um, and I talked about the overall food landscape in a big way if we, if we were just to say, well, we're not going to use them anymore. But the other part is, is that the synthetic chemicals aren't able to keep up as well with the, the changing climate. And for this reason, I've, I've, I've taken to basically saying that conventional farming is faltering. Okay, we have been able to round up the world. We've been able to GMO all our soybeans. We've been able to, you know, control a lot of different pests. But the way that we do this is causing massive soil loss, degradation of our water supplies, loss of biodiversity, loss of pollinators, um, loss of, um, you know, um, plants that actually can harbor in our habitat for beneficial insect species. Um, and then, as I just said, we can't even, they can't keep up with the registration process in new materials. Um, and so we need to think of this in a different way. And this is where IPM, the overall concept, really begins to play a much bigger role. Because while we want to keep these things in, in, in the library, in our back pocket options, um, if we don't use them more intelligently, we'll lose them one way or another. And so integrated pest management is a better way to come at this so that instead of looking at, instead of the first question that we ask as farmers in the morning is what do we spray, it's the last question we ask. And we go through a whole step of things that, um, that allow us to address cultural and sanitation uh, issues out in the orchard that help to reduce pressures. Um, so that there aren't problems and that if there are problems we intervene a lot less frequently and with softer materials and again continue to leverage all these other things. So IPM and again as I said IPM is is an overarching concept um, this this it really should be kind of entitled ecological and I'll get into why in just a middle in a minute but IPM is basically, it's a toolbox of management strategies and tactics that range from doing nothing to spraying chemicals. And I'll get into some of what that is in a minute. And the purpose is to help control insect disease and weed pests and physiological disorders in order to grow a marketable and profitable crop, whatever your crop is, carrots or apples. What's your sweet disease and physiological disorder? Well, physiological disorder could be... Um, um, it, it could be just a nutritional deficiency. So if you don't have enough magnesium, magnesium is one of the core elements in chlorophyll. If you don't have good chlorophyll, you can't photosynthesize optimally, you can't photosynthesize, you know, it's just, so it's something like that, yeah. Um, what are some of the un untapped opportunities in IPM? And I, I say this, this I, I call this from an organic slide, but um, what we're really looking at is what the IPM toolbox looks like. And so again, it ranges from sanitation, so you're getting dead, dying, disease trees or stuff out of, the, out of the soil. Cultural, could be building up the organic matter, could be using cover crops, could be using companion cropping. Um, uh, in orchards, it would be varieties that aren't susceptible to certain diseases or rootstocks that aren't fire blight susceptible. Um, or growing a tree that's a bit more vigorous so that it's not quite as susceptible to climate change. Um, nutrition. One of the things that we don't do in nutrition, and a lot of people don't think of nutrition as an integrated pest management tool, but what nutrition is, tip, is one of these things that I think has been overlooked for far too long in orcharding. And the reason I say that is, is that if you open up a manual, and it doesn't matter whether it's Cornell or UMass or Penn State or whoever, it takes a very conventional viewpoint to, what, to how nutrition should be applied to, to orcharding uh, or any other agriculture. Um, and by that, it's like, 
it's, it's an NPK approach, maybe with a few little you know, bells and whistles thrown in on the end. In orchards, typically your average commercial orchard, you're gonna put some calcium nitrate, nitrogen on in the spring. You might put two applications of that on. Um, you might spray some calcium for bitter fit in your honey crisp through the summer. You might put a little you know, zinc and boron in there uh, to help with it. winter damage and decrease the viability of, of flowers. But you're really just sort of like giving it enough so that it survives. And what we need is to have an optimal nutrition strategy. And the, the, the analogy that I like to use is like, if we, were to, if we were to eat once or twice a year, or just when we were sick to get us back up to some baseline level of health, we'd be in pretty poor condition. I mean, our brains wouldn't function, our bodies wouldn't function, you know, and, and we, would, we really wouldn't be able to be the optimal individual that we can be, no matter what you know, line of work or, or lifestyle that we're in. And we need to think of trees the same way, and they really need to be fed on a more consistent basis because, one, they're growing throughout the season, and they're growing a crop, and that you know that's you know they're, that crop is taking nutrients away from the tree. It's taking it out of the soil, um, and if there's not enough there to support that crop or the tree, you know it eventually begins to decline a little bit. Now it may not be visible in a given year or two years that it's declining, but say you take 10 or 20 percent off of the life of that tree or that orchard. You know, you, then you're talking about maybe five or ten years that you lost because that that tree, that orchard, wasn't taken care of as as um, as well as it could be. But the other part is that the tree needs different nutrients at different times of the year, and these are what we call critical developmental periods. And so, when the, when the tree first leaves out, it needs a certain set of nutrients. Versus when it's starting to flower, it needs some more nutrients. Versus when it's setting fruit, it needs another set of nutrients. To when it's actually growing the crop during the summer, and then quote unquote finishing it off in the fall, it needs n different nutrients even then. And then this time of the year, it needs different stuff because now it's gone through this six month stressful period, and we want to just walk away and put it to bed, and then hope that it wakes up next April and is ready and raring to go. So part of the reason I say this is, is that optimal nutrition for a tree does all these things, but it, all, it makes it healthier so that it's not as susceptible to certain insect and disease attacks. Um, technology, um, another one, there's a lot of technology, technological tools out there, you know, from basic like rain gauges to electronic weather stations. There's all types of online modeling that help us to better understand disease cycles, insect cycles, um, irrigation cycles uh, in the orchard so that when we do need to intervene and do things, we're doing it with the, 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 the best most um, real-time information that we possibly can. A lot of conventional apple growers will go out and spray captan and manzate every five to seven days to the spring because it's scab season. Well, the fact is, is that you may not have a scab infection, um, you know, and so you shouldn't, you don't necessarily need to go out and spray for scab. Using some of these models, we have the ability to, to, to at least forecast a few days ahead and say, oh, it's going to rain Saturday and Sunday and the temperatures are going to be perfect and we're looking at like it's going to be wet all weekend, perfect scab infection conditions, let's go out and spray on Friday, get things covered up, as opposed to spraying on Monday and then again on Friday. And, and the same thing with insects, and again, I don't, I, we don't have time to go into this to excruciating detail, but some of these technological tools allow us to better understand what's going on out in the orchard, and whether it's conventional or organic or something in between, to be able to time what we need to do appropriately for the problem at hand, as opposed to just prophylactically going out there and throwing a tarp over the thing and, and, and protecting it from whatever may come down the, the line, which you know, 70% of the time is nothing. Um, biological controls are becoming more popular, even in conventional. These can range from things, there's a product called Regalia, which is a fermented plant extract from Japanese knotweed, very high in resveratrol. Um, it triggers immune responses in the plant itself, so that the plant is developing phytochemicals that help it to fend off diseases and insect attacks as well. Um, 
to live organisms that you can apply um, on the tree. Uh, for apples, one would be Blossom Protect, which is, is a, is a yeast-like mixture. And, and essentially what you're doing is just sort of coating the flower with yeast so that when the uh, fire blight bacteria lands there, there's just no place for it to, to grow and it just sort of, you know, dries up and dies, hopefully. Um, none of it's bulletproof, but we're finding that there's a lot of these in nature that range from, you know, plant-based compounds to toxins that insects make to toxins. So if you're familiar with spinosad um, and trust, okay, that actually came from an actinomycete mushroom that was developed. Now, we don't go out and cultivate actinomycete mushrooms in order to create lots of spinosad. They've been able to develop that in a laboratory, but that's a product that came from nature that allows us to control insects um, in organic orchards as well as conventional orchards. Um, so there's a wide range of biological controls out there and I think the last thing would be uh, in terms of biologicals would be the, the, uh, the introduction of beneficial insects into the orchard and so when you think of like aphids, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of aphids? Yeah, so ladybugs, um, both the adult and the larval form of ladybug, like to consume aphids um, at a very high rate. Um, but if you don't have enough ladybugs and you have a lot of aphids, you know, it's, it's going to take quite a long time. But you can buy ladybugs and you can buy them from labs that rear them. They'll send them to you in a nice little pouch. You release them into the orchard and you can kind of, instead of spraying for the aphids, you release ladybugs out and they begin to take care of the problem um, and they are really surprisingly efficient when they're when the numbers are right um, at taking care of aphids and there's a whole bunch of other insects there's lace wings that you can you can release um, there's surfed flies um, there's even parasitic nematodes that you can release in the soil that take care of Pathog uh, endomopathogenic nematodes in the soil, as well as um, they'll take, they can take care of um, boring insects. And I don't mean like lackluster, no fun to be around insects, but <laughs> insects that, you know, bore into the tree of the, the trunk of the tree. Um, and then we end up here with chemical sprays and stuff. And the last thing is people. And I think people is really important because people um, who are interested in growing food uh, are becoming rarer and rarer in this country and our technological capacity is becoming less and less. Part of the reason I have way more work than I can handle most years is because, you know, Cornell's ramp ramping down their ability to be in the field to, to do the on-site investigations and assessments of orchards and farms. Um, but also the people the farmers can hire are, they're there to do a job and they don't necessarily come with a technological know-how. And so training of people, encouraging people to get into farming, um, getting people to be able to be good observers of what's going on around them and not just bookworms. Um, you know, I know everything about scab, but I, I don't have any idea what, how to look for it out in the orchard. You know, is a, it's, a, it's a critical hurdle in that whole thing. Um, and so people is a big part of that IPM toolbox. But you can see, and I didn't put people last because they're the least important, but you can see how we go from things that don't require any chemical intervention to things where we're like, okay, we've got a problem, let's go spray something. Whether it's in trust or Alticor or Captan or Sulfur, you know, we have a whole wide range of options in the IPM toolbox. Um, okay, so. So I want to stop here for two seconds, and I have no time uh, idea what time it is, but somebody will throw something at me when it gets too late. Okay, so I've got enough time. So anyway, so um, when the LR thing went down, um, NRDC got involved, Meryl Streep got involved, there was a lot of public publicity over it. She started an organization called Mothers and Others for a Livable Planet to really kind of focus on chemical residues and you may have seen the commercials 30 years ago where she's standing over a kitchen sink scrubbing you know her apples and carrots to get all the pesticide residues off and it was really a landscape level shift in terms of how how uh, in terms of consumer awareness and how consumers began to perceive their food supply uh, on many different levels out of that um, in the late 90s, there was a, a company that got started as a nonprofit organization called Red Tomato Marketing. 
and I don't know if you know Red Tomato Marketing. Okay, some of you do, some of you don't. They're based in Boston. Um, they work primarily in, in New England, although they are in New York and a few other places. Um, but their whole idea was out of this because Allard hit Macintosh growers in New England so hard, and it hit Apple growers in general so hard. Um, and consumer awareness was so high, and they were they didn't want to buy apples, or they were worried that there was you know problems with it. That, that Red Tomato wanted to give apple growers an option, both in terms of production and in terms of marketing. Oh, I don't want to say on that. This apple packing store is a casualty of of Allar. I mean, basically, Bell View went out in like '87, and it was largely because because they were shipping Macs across the country. Yeah. Totally. yeah, and it was like, so in, in New England in 1934, there was a big freeze, and the, the casualties of that were Baldwins. There, I mean, it wasn't like they just decided to not grow Baldwins in 1935. The trees literally exploded. It went from being very, very warm to very cold, killed the processing industry on, on a certain level, killed the Baldwin industry to a certain level. Allard did the same thing to Macintosh. A lot of growers just decided to get out. They switched to new varieties. You know, maybe they just decided not to plant apples again at, at all. But it was a, it was a casualty, and it wasn't a casual casualty. It was like a major devastating thing. Overall, I think it was good for the industry because it began this to shift. Um, but it was absolutely devastating. Um, so red tomato. Coupled with an, uh, another new organization that's based in Madison, Wisconsin, called the IPM Institute of North America. Now, the IPM Institute of North America was started by and is still run by a guy named Tom Green. And it doesn't have to do with just apples or just agriculture, but pest, you know, use, pesticide use in general. They worked in concert with Red Tomato to develop um, what's called the Eco Apple brand or label. And the Eco Apple protocol, which has been refined a lot over the years, but essentially takes this toolbox and puts it into practical terms for apple growers so that they know what to do and when for particular pests. They do get audited. So if they, and when they get audited, they, you know, if they pass the audit, then they can use the Eco Apple label. They can, their red tomato can sell their, their fruit. But it is, it's really one of the only true integrated pest management programs that is, is laid out in such detail that it's something that any apple grower can really grasp. It's not chemical free, it's not organic, it literally is, it's kind of in between. But what it's doing is it's taking growers through this process of like, do all the things you can do before you start to spray, but if you do need to spray, follow these guidelines too. Um, it's a roadmap, and it's a very important roadmap because um, one, it gave uh, orchardists in New England um, a path to go with, with their fruit um, and a way to grow their fruit that helped them speak to consumers differently, helped them to speak to buyers differently, helped to you know, um, be in their community differently. Um, it's had its challenges, that's to be sure. And it, had, like I say, it's evolved. So when it first came out, the use of imidan, which is an organophosphate, was still allowed. Um, it's no longer allowed. And I would, they would like to say that they're uh, organophosphate free, but there's one other insecticide called Lord's Band, which is an organophosphate, which is under an incredible amount of scrutiny right now, both um, by consumers, but also the EPA, because of the effects that it can have on the brains of, of developing children. Um, but it's also one of the only insecticides that, they, that is available to apple growers um, that can control a lot of uh, a certain type of insect. Now, the restrictions in terms of how Lord's Band is used are pretty tight, and I don't want to, again, use up all the time talking about this. But Red Tomato, without being a really sort of draconian approach to growing apples that is available to a few growers, it's got some flexibility in there, but it's also a very clear path on how IPM can be used that is a true middle ground between hardcore conventional and organic apple growing. Um, and, and more than that, it illustrates and exemplifies just how much IPM technology is available to growers, 
but also on the dark side of things, it's like how much is not being used by growers. And it's absolutely astonishing the amount of technology and information and, and approaches that are out there under the IPM banner that are simply just not being used, either because they're not understood or because growers are like, it's cheaper to go spray. Is so. it cheaper to go spray? Yes, it is. Yep. Um, when in, both in terms of cost of IPM implementation um, and in terms of not having lost product, either from productivity or aesthetics. So. Roughly how much percentage? Oh, I, I mean, so you're, okay, so your average apple grower, you know, Joe Schmo in the Hudson Valley is going to spend about $1,200 per, per acre per year on synthetic chemicals, okay? Their gross revenue per acre, if they're growing Honeycrisp, is probably somewhere between forty dollars and $50,000 an acre. Okay, to put IPM into play would cost them about $800 an acre more, okay? Which isn't a lot, but it's $800 they don't want to spend. So, you know. And some of that would be using different chemicals that are more expensive. Some of it would be the devices that you have to use, mating disruption, monitoring traps, um, paying people to actually know what the hell they're doing when they're out in the field and they're scouting for something. So, you know, that $800 is, you know, and that's a rough estimate of mine. But I would say that, you know, hardcore, just spray, 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 1200 bucks an acre. IPM is probably about 2000 on top of that. Um, so, anyway, so instead of calling this organic, I called it ecological because it could cut across, again, many different camps. Organic, holistic, biodynamic, something in between, benign neglect, my favorite. Um, but organic agriculture, as we recognize it, it really start, got its start in the mid 20th century. Um, for a long time, it remained an oddity and it was not regarded as very scientific. Um, but things are changing rapidly as organic farming matures in the modern age. Um, a lot of the R&D and education that's going along with this change is, becoming, is, be, is because of consumer awareness that is forcing farmers to consider organic agriculture as a part of what they do. Now, in addition to apples, by the other commodity, or I should say tree fruit, the other commodity group I do a lot of work with is sweet potatoes, believe it or not. And so I work with a lot of large sweet potato growers down in North Carolina. And it's interesting to know that, uh, and what by large, I mean the largest one that I worked with this year grew about 5,000 acres of sweet potatoes. Um, you know, some of them have as much as 80% of their production in organic because the demand for organic sweet potatoes is that high. Um, I don't want to get, again, off into a tangent on talking about sweet potatoes, but the differences between conventional sweet potatoes and conventional apples is night and day. They spray two times before they plant the sweet potatoes, and that's it for the rest of the year. Conventional agriculture or orcharding may spray 25 times before you, they actually get to harvest, and they will spray through the season right up to harvest. So you know, even conventional sweet potatoes are an entirely different um, um, level of intensiveness than, than uh, conventional apples. And by, I put it up here, but much lower in terms of its intensiveness. They grow, they harvest. Um, the biggest hurdles to successfully growing apples organically has been really the unfortunate fixation on cosmetics. A lot of the pesticides get applied, and again, I'm spitballing, a number might be you know, as much as 60% of the pesticides that are applied to apples are for cosmetic purposes. Um, so if you take that $1,200 and you take 40% of that, that's probably a good idea of what you would need to spray um, if you were going to do a conventional cider orchard, for example, where cosmetics aren't all that important. Um, the majority of pesticides used in conventional apple growing are for purposes of making sure apples are appealing to consumers. A lot of this lays at the feet of the buyers who continue to perpetuate this, this reality that you know, an apple that's got any type of defect is not an apple worth buying. And they force that on the suppliers, the growers, and the growers have to comply, otherwise they're not going to sell their apples to Hannaford's or Shaw's or Big Y or, or whoever. 
it's great that there's co-ops around, there's great that there's farm markets, farm stands, CSAs, et cetera, so that that conversation can happen differently. But for the vast majority of apples that are grown in the United States, around the world, cosmetics drives the largest percentage of pesticide use um, of any of the pesticides that are used. Um, and that goes for fertilizers too, you know. I mean, yield is a big part of it. There's a lot of nitrogen that's put on those trees. Um, and as we're probably all aware, um, your average supermarket apple doesn't taste like a whole lot because it's mostly devoid of phytochemicals and it's mostly water and sugar. Um, but if you were to get a really nice ash meads kernel um, that was grown, you know, under more holistic or even IPM situations, it's going to have more phytochemicals, more flavor, um, less water, um, and it's actually going to taste like something. So, what are phytochemicals? Oh, you know, tannins, um, all the stuff that makes cider really good. You know. Um, so the time has come, and this is my preachy part of it: is the time has come for Eastern apple growers to embrace.